Welcome to Happy Talks with Dr. Alice and Donovan. Dr. Alice Fong is a holistic, naturopathic doctor and founder of Amorta Swa Wellness. And Donovan Jensen is a software engineer and founder of HowToHappy.com. Together, they're out to cause more happiness in the world. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Happy Talks. My name is Dr. Alice, and here's my awesome co-host, Donovan. And today, I have a very special guest. Beth Shaw is a best-selling author, nutritionist, mind-body expert, and founder of Yoga Fit, an international mind-body training school. She is a well-respected entrepreneur who has the distinction of being one of the few women business owners of scale in the fitness industry for over 20 years. Please welcome Beth. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Yes, yes. So tell us a little about your story into the mind-body space and yoga. How did, how did that happen? Well, it actually started when I was very young. At age six, I taught myself guided uh, meditation and imagery wow. because I used to suffer from horrible migraine headaches. Hmm. And I grew up in a family where people were not that invested in what was going on with me. So I learned to cure those migraines by just visualizing myself on a beach or in the forest and doing some deep breathing. Mm -hmm. That's kind of where my mind body journey began. Um, I used to practice yoga poses as a child, not really knowing what they were. Mm -hmm. And then in college, I was stretching one day after a workout and I, it's like the sky opened up and, and there was a message and I just got the message that I was going to be uh, successful in the health and fitness space. Mm -hmm. so that those are kind of my uh, touch points for getting started in the industry that I'm currently in. Great, great. And what kind of drew you to the, the yoga aspect? Um, you know, I started practicing formal yoga when I moved to Los Angeles after college, and I just really fell in love with it. I There weren't many teacher trainings at the time, so I went in residence for about a month somewhere when I came back to start teaching in health clubs in Los Angeles. I found that, you know, uh, teaching in a health club required a very certain uh, format and style that I wasn't taught and I kind of developed. Mm -hmm. The name Yoga Fit came to me one day on a bike ride. I trademarked it. One of my students who was um, very into Tai Chi and he was also an investor saw the potential in the brand. By that time I had put it on a bunch of clothing, my mm -hmm. logo when I was teaching. and. Um, he helped me raise uh, money of which he put in some himself and we incorporated in 1997 and we've been operating as a school pretty much ever since. So there's a lot of interesting things in your background. I noticed as I was poking around. So can we actually just keep, keep going towards the, the present from that point? I mean, there's been a, a several years between now and then, and I know you've been up to some awesome things. If you could fill in some of the other cool projects that you've worked on since then. Uh, well, you know, since then, obviously, I've had the opportunity to go to India. In fact, at Yoga Fit, we take groups to India every year, and that's been mm -hmm. hugely transformational for me. Mm -hmm. I, doing what I do forces me to stay in alignment mm -hmm. with um, the teachings of our school. And so I'm constantly just working on improving myself in, in every way. And I, I like to call yoga the gateway drug because for me, it opened the door to so many beautiful, wonderful explorations, whether it's meditation or plant medicine or you know studying things in Asia. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it really opened me up to the possibilities of the universe and then just a lot of uh, great teachings that we're able to bring to people through our school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love it. I definitely had a really positive experience with yoga myself. And, you know, I'd say it, it is <laughs> kind of like a gateway drug to open your mind to mindfulness, meditation, more alternative therapies. Um, what, one of the things that resonated with me with what you said, and I, I love that you termed or coined the term yoga fit, because for me, I do enjoy yoga, but you know, it really depends on the style there. Cause there's so many different styles out there. Like a general, like Hatha yoga is nice, but like the gentle yoga, it's like nice and calming. But I, I, I feel like I was always in the mindset, like, no, I got to break a sweat. It's got to be hard <laughs> to, for me to feel like I got something out of it. So I would go like gravitate more to the, like, um, uh, vinyasa in the hot, the hot, hot yoga and things like that. So I'd be curious, um, you know, what styles do you particularly like? 
Um, well, the style that we teach is called Yoga Fit, and it models the traditional group exercise format of warm up, mm -hmm. work, and cool down. Mm -hmm. Very appropriate for a health club environments. Obviously, we've grown so much as a school in 23 years that we really have every different type of yoga now. We have restorative yoga and yin yoga. We have yoga as therapy, many um, mental health programs. Our Yoga Fit Warriors program helps people who are dealing with PTSD, trauma, depression, anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I've actually uh, struggled with a mood disorder my entire life. So, um, and I really go into it in, in this, which is my most recent book, it's called Healing Trauma with Yoga. Um, and there are a lot of practical tips in there for people to really take their mental health into their own hands on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So, you know, every day you can pretty much find me in my headstand machine with my red lights in my face, mm -hmm. uh, just trying to keep my mood elevated. And um, I think that people really, you know, such as yourself need to find styles that work best for them and not just, you know, go to one yoga class and right. maybe they don't have the best experience and then they stop there because mm -hmm. there, there's so many different styles and, and really different times of the day and different times of our life. And as women, different times of the month, we're going to need different styles. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I just got back actually from having a workout at the gym and I always finish my workout with at least 10 minutes of just some lower back stretches and stretching mm -hmm. out my hips and hamstrings and things that if, if I wasn't doing, I'd have a lot of repetitive use injuries. So yoga is so nice because it can apply to anything and make whatever sport you're doing, whatever activity more enjoyable and, and you'll have less injuries. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that I, I think a lot of common misconceptions about yoga is like, I think some people who've never done it, they have this idea that like, it's oh, for a really super flexible fit, like girls in their twenties or something like that. But it really is for everyone. It's just finding the right style for you. Um, so what would you say to someone who was just like a complete novice, don't really know how to even get started? How would they even begin that process? I think they can find a local studio. They can go to a class at their gym. They can go on our website at yogafit.com and search an instructor in their area. But I would really suggest, and I did this too before I took any teacher trainings, is I tried all different types mm -hmm. of yoga. And they were, you know, now of course it's more challenging for me uh, because I'm a little bit more of a discerning customer, but I think <laughs> you can always find mm -hmm. something good about pretty much every class as long as it's safe. Right. Yeah, and I think it kind of goes back to what you're saying about finding the style that works for you. Um, I actually don't have a ton of yoga experience. So if there are broad categories or buckets or different types of yoga that we could just go through briefly, like touch on uh, what different styles are or, or how they might uh, come across or what you do. I'm not asking a very clear question because I'm not that well versed in the space. But um, yeah, if you could just give some like broad definitions, that'd be awesome. So if, if people are looking for a more athletic activity, they can do Ashtanga, they can do a Vinyasa style, they can do hot yoga. If they're looking for something more relaxing uh, to calm their anxiety, uh, to get into their sympathetic nervous system, um, then they can do restorative yoga, yin yoga. So there are, um, or if someone's looking to activate their chakras and raise their energetic vibration. They might want to try Kundalini yoga. Mm. Uh, those are just a few styles that I think cover what most people are looking for. Yeah, that's great because I have been to several yoga classes and not paid attention to what, what the different styles were or whatnot. So I have been pleasantly and unpleasantly surprised in ways of like, okay, I'm ready to get a workout and then calmed and brought all the way down. Or like, okay, I'm, I'm ready to, you know, like really push it and then, it's like really hard, advanced stretching moves that like I don't have the flexibility for. So I think that'll be helpful for people who are like we were talking about sort of just starting to get into it and being able to discern uh, which style might be a fit for them in general, or at least for the mood of the day, because I did not follow that very well at all in the past. Yeah. And I was I would I'd love to get a little more into the since you wrote a book about healing trauma with yoga you can speak a little more on that, like what's the mechanism or what's the approach um, behind it? Like, how does that work? 
Well, the approach behind it, the, the book starts out with the ACE test, which stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences, which I think is a test that, you know, I wish they were to give us in school when we were yeah. 16 years old. Right. And it's a simple nine point test that helps you to determine how much trauma you have. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the more, um, and you know, and I have childhood trauma too, again, I put that in the book, uh, the more trauma you have, the more likelihood that you're going to move towards addiction, mm -hmm. um, bad relationships, unstable job history, mm -hmm. divorce, uh, suicidal tendencies, you know, there's a, there's a whole list, um, unfortunately, but I think, like anything else, awareness is the first step. So the book opens with that. Mm -hmm. And then we get into how trauma affects the brain. Now, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think right now everybody should be reading the book because like if people weren't traumatized pre-COVID, we've all been traumatized. <laughs> no. Yeah. I, every time I go to go into my apartment building, I still have a little catch that, oh, I don't have my mask and we don't mm -hmm. need masks anymore. But I, I have that like ingrained anxiety response just for something so simple as do I have my mask or not mm -hmm. uh, and I, I know that a lot of people are struggling right now with a lot of uh, trauma depression you know even myself I have all the tools available to me but because my life has changed so much um, due to COVID and I'm not traveling around the world and presenting and teaching and all of that um, you know, I, I still struggle also so the book um, as we get into how yoga helps with trauma and some specific yoga poses that actually release trauma from the body, which we teach in our mm -hmm. Yoga Fit Warriors program. Uh, then the book gets into solutions, which is where I like to focus. So we talk about meditation, mm -hmm. sound healing, Ayurveda, mm -hmm. uh, clean eating for better mental health. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a whole chapter, my favorite chapter is chapter 12, which is about living your best life and basically has 22 tips of, of little things that you can do every day just to feel better. Mm -hmm. So it's a very comprehensive book. It's very solution oriented, but I think one of the things that differentiates the book from other books is that not only do I share my story, but we have 13 other people sharing mm -hmm. their trauma stories and then how they were able to either just mitigate their symptoms or recover from trauma or cope better using, mm -hmm. again, things like sound healing, meditation, breathing exercises, mm -hmm. Ayurveda, Ayurvedic hacks. Um, mm -hmm. So you get real life stories and very diverse stories too. Um, which are, are great. There's one story that I love about a gentleman who was with the Canadian military and they had to go where there was a big plane crash out in Nova Scotia. And he was so traumatized from having to deal with the carnage of that, that mm -hmm. he started drinking, became an alcoholic, at mm -hmm. some point got sober, started practicing yoga. He's been trained by Yoga Fit and now teaches. And, you know, I also love it because I, I like it when men share their stories too, because mm -hmm you don't always find um, men as open to sharing their, their traumatic stories as you do women. So we've got a nice cross section in the book of, of people sharing their trauma and triumphing over the trauma using different mind body applications. I love that. Yes. I, I as just as a, as a naturopathic doctor, I see it all the time because I specialize in stress and anxiety that you now oftentimes there's this history of trauma or childhood wounds that really affects people, especially in their bodies. I think the, the trauma gets stored in our bodies and it's a hard thing to release. So I could see how yoga can be a way to help release that, that trauma and definitely be a really powerful tool. Yeah. Yeah. And, and a lot of people, you know, they're, they're practicing yoga and maybe they get an insight during final relaxation, Shavasana about something that happened to them or they're in a specific pose. I remember once I was teaching someone who had recovered from a heart attack and he was in a chest expansion and then had like a flashback mm -hmm. of on the table. Um, and, you know, he really had like a moment and it's because the issues are literally stored in our tissues. So mm -hmm. reading the body of trauma on a regular basis mm -hmm. uh, is, I think it's, very uh, helpful and also it's necessary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, do you find that sort of doing, and you mentioned a bunch of different tactics, so it, it may already be covered, but do you find that doing sort of some of these yoga poses releases the trauma in a way that is 
complete on its own or do you find that there are other mental tools or other you know like outside tools that you need so for example you, you mentioned the person who you know was kind of having this flashback to this heart attack type thing right and maybe i'm um, extrapolating a little bit but maybe it was a moment of like wrestling with mortality or something like that do you find that there are other um pieces that need to come into play to help people like move through some of these experiences or is it really that kind of releasing the trauma through uh, the different poses and the different physical uh, movements is enough to help them move past it. I don't know if that's, does that make sense? No, but I mean, that's an interesting question. And I'll tell you another story. I had a very good friend that I grew up with in New York City. Actually, her brother was my first boyfriend. And he uh, died in his 40s of a, a here we go again, widow maker heart attack. Oh. And then his wife had uh, cancer and died like a year later. So my friend, um, who was also a military correspondent in the Middle East, and, and she was working for Fox News in uh, Iraq and um, had a lot of trauma from that. And then also having to raise her brother's kids. She and her mom had to raise uh, Sean's kids. And she obviously had been through a lot of therapy and all of that. I, I took her to one of our Yoga Fit Warriors trainings and she was able to half her medication after the weekend. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, I would be remiss to say that yoga is going to take care of everything because it doesn't. But I think it's a very multifaceted approach, mm -hmm. depending upon the individual. Definitely talk therapy is helpful. Group therapy is super helpful. Things mm -hmm. like Alice is doing, uh, acupuncture, herbal medicine, also very important. You know, we're so complex as beings mm -hmm. and trauma affects everyone similarly in that it, it changes the brain and you know it shrinks our prefrontal cortex and it makes us stay in fight or flight a lot more often and, and hypervigilance and all of that but also it affects people in different ways and different people need different tools to heal mm -hmm. so i always um i wrote another book called yoga lean mm -hmm. and in this book i talk about how weight loss needs to be a very multifaceted approach mm -hmm. so i feel the same way about uh trauma I think that people should, you know, do as many different, be open to as many different things as possible to heal. And some things that might be a little bit uh, non-traditional, again, like plant medicine, I'm a huge fan of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, yeah. Know I, concur. <laughs> I concur with that sentiment because it's like, hey, if it helps you do it, there's so many tools available. So why not utilize as many as you can to help you feel the best? Because it is so, so multifaceted. You know, and it, it blows my mind. I recently found out a friend of mine that had been a binge drinker from age 13 to 32, mm. uh, who was, you know, now nearing 50, had never even been to traditional talk therapy. And I, mm -hmm. I, you know, I think that because we're all in the field, we mm -hmm. naturally assume that everyone's going to be doing therapy and doing mm -hmm. groups and doing all these different things. But mm -hmm. a lot of people just, you know, will suffer uh, sometimes in silence and not yeah. uh, reach out to, you know, whatever it is, 12 step programs or whatever. There's so many resources out there mm -hmm. and so many different solutions. Um, it, it would just be my hope that people will try as many different things as possible just to see what works for them. Yeah, absolutely. I'd be curious, you know, as a stress and anxiety doctor, I sometimes experience people that have just so much trauma PTSD where they, they like trying to get them to relax is very challenging. So I can imagine trying them, getting them to relax in yoga um, can be a challenge for them. So do you have any, any tools or suggestions for people who are just like so rigid in their body and that they have, a, because like allowing them to relax makes them feel vulnerable and perhaps unsafe. So it's like, do you have any ideas or suggestions for those types of people that really, they can't even do like even very basic poses or something like that? Well, it's interesting because we have several trauma-informed yoga trainings at Yoga mm -hmm. And I actually once made the mistake of going into one of them and having mm -hmm. people like dance around a little bit mm -hmm. um, with their, their backs turned towards the doors mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and people were, you know, really having a challenge just with that. Mm -hmm. So in our trauma-informed yoga, we, you know, we make sure that people know where the exits are. Mm -hmm. like, you can imagine dealing with people who are in the military. They always want to know where the exits are, mm -hmm. uh, keeping the room dim, but not completely dark, mm -hmm. um, 
you know, before I'll adjust anyone in a pose, I always say I'm coming around to make adjustments. If you don't want to be adjusted, let me know. Because even if you have people in final relaxation and you go to pull their ankles and shavasana yeah. or something, if someone's, you know, had some kind of sexual trauma or physical trauma, they're going to jump through the roof. It's happened. And you're going to just take away all the, the good work you did teaching them yoga for an hour. Right. So I, um, I like our style in particular for trauma-based yoga because it's a lot of repetitive flow, at least for the first 20 to 30 minutes. Mm. And what happens to the brain is that it becomes entrainment. It almost becomes like a hypnotic state because we match breath with movement. Mm -hmm. So you're able to really kind of get into that more of a rest and digest place mm -hmm. than fight or flight. Mm -hmm. It takes, it takes time, but it happens. And, you know, you probably can relate to this from going to the gym and, you know, you might not feel like you want to be there for a workout, but then 20, 25 minutes in, you're feeling good. I think it takes that long for us to get into a certain zone. Mm. Yeah. As I was listening, um, it kind of stood out to me. It sounds like there are certain types of trauma that really carry themselves in the body in a way that basically you dissociate or just aren't as comfortable leaving your, your body in a relaxed state or having yourself, uh, at least for me, whenever I'm doing yoga, I feel very vulnerable because I'm twisted all kinds of different ways and stretched out. And it sounds like that's a really strong step to bringing yourself back into alignment with your body and having more comfort around some of those pieces. Um, so I, I, going back to, um, a couple of steps before when we were talking about sort of dealing with the trauma with different tools, um, it probably makes sense or it now makes sense to me that for a lot of people, people find it a really valuable tool that they may not get the same kind of value from like talk therapy or something because so much of the, the trauma experience or what they're kind of protecting themselves against or shelling up against is this sort of physical space. Um, so there's not really a question here, but it's just something that kind of I mean, tumbled out as I was listening. These are all very uh, excellent points and, and uh, very intelligent uh, to bring up. So thank you for that. Um, I, I know personally, like one of the best things I can do for people is to give them the gift of being really being in their bodies and experiencing that. Um, because when people get comfortable being in the bodies that they're in, the, the judgment starts to go away, mm. uh, the resistance starts to go away, and they really start to live a fully expressed life. And one of the most beautiful things that happen also is that people then start to take care of their bodies better. They mm. put the right foods in them, they don't abuse alcohol, or they don't, they don't overdo anything. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times we find with people who have trauma, is that they become severely overweight as a barrier mechanism to keep people literally mm -hmm. physically away from them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they might resort to other substances uh, as, an, as an addictive mechanism, but you'll find that a lot of uh, people who have severe weight problems had some type of trauma and they're really just shielding themselves. You know, the thing is that it doesn't feel good to live in a body that's not healthy. So then you're compounding the problem of the original trauma with the trauma of just living in something you're not comfortable in every day because we, have, you know, we only get one body each lifetime and we have to live in it. Um, you know, unless you're doing some intense heavy duty meditation uh, or do a ceremony for a night, but you, you're coming back into your body. So I just really um, like our practice because it gives people the gift of their bodies and, and therapy, like I've been in and out of therapy since 22 years old. I think therapy is great. However, it's hard to mm -hmm. deconstruct the mind with the mind. Mm -hmm. And with talk therapy, you know, you may feel better for a little while, but then you're not going to, or um, you're also putting the reliance on an external source, which I think for, mm -hmm. for periods of time is okay. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, I really want to see people take charge of their own physical and mental health, which is not to say they can't go get a prescription medication for something or whatever, but just knowing that you're in charge of your health, your physical health, your mental health, and there are things you can do to improve both, mm -hmm. I think empowers an individual. And again, my goal is to just empower as many people as possible to be their most fully expressed selves, live their best life and um, carry with them and live in at the healthiest body possible. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. That was so beautifully expressed. And I agree that, you know, we empowerment is so important in that there's so many things that we can do, but we have to start by taking care of ourselves and practicing self-care, self-love um, to really even begin that journey. And yeah, therapy is absolutely beneficial, but you know, there's a lot of things that you have to do on your own to really fully heal completely. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, healing is a, is a one day at a time proposition. Mm -hmm. Um, Some days are going to be better than others. Mm. Um, Again, because I've struggled with a mood disorder uh, for most of my life, you know, Mm -hmm. some days are great. Other days suck, but at least when the days suck, I can acknowledge what's going on. I can do, you know, take a tool from my tool basket, uh, whether it's my head's down with my red light or going to the gym or simply just saying, I'm going to just sit in this space until it passes because I know that it will. One of the most valuable things mm-hmm. I do for mood regulation is meditation. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'll work a lot and I'll get like kind of frenetic and I'll get all these ideas because I'm a very creative person. And then at a certain point during the day, I'm like, I just need to stop. I need to meditate, can be a guided meditation, can be TM, it can be whatever type of meditation, just like yoga, try different ones, see Mm -hmm. what works for you. If you really want a low maintenance meditation, you know, get on YouTube and find a guided meditation. Mm -hmm. I have a couple of them on iTunes also. Uh, But meditation is a great way to kind of take the garbage out of our minds, recenter ourselves and also get a reset. Mm. Yes, totally. Yeah. I'm a huge advocate for, for mindfulness and meditation <laughs> for sure. Because I think a lot of us, especially in the U S we're just so like, go, go, go culture. And there's something profound and beautiful in just being able to be in the stillness, to be present in the moment, exactly. um, rest and recover can yeah. go such a long way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we don't, we don't give enough value to rest. You know, we're always on <laughs> we social don't. media or our phones and mm-hmm. uh, we're bombarded constantly. Mm-hmm. And it's, uh, it's so valuable to create some space for yourself physically and mentally. Absolutely. So on that note with uh, meditation piece, uh, I know a lot of people talk about kind of yoga and meditation having some number of overlaps. I don't think I've done enough yoga to get there because when I do it, it's, I'm not in a meditative state, right? I'm in a very focused, like, how do I get into this pose? How do I do this? So I'd be curious what you see as, as some of the connections there and maybe what, if, if that's something you experience, what maybe the process that you go through is if you're going to have like a yoga practice, that's also going to be meditative or if it just happens naturally, or just, just kind of how those pieces come together for you. Um, okay. Well, you know, yoga was actually originally designed just to ready the body for meditation so people could sit for long periods of time without, you know, getting antsy or having their joints hurt or their muscles, their bones. Uh, so yoga was designed to ready the body for meditation. Um, you know, to be honest with you, when I practice, it's, it's not always a meditative state. Sometimes it takes a little while to get in there. I think that the best way for anyone to try to find that meditative state is just to focus on their breath. If it's a style that emphasizes breath with movement, that uh, becomes an easier way to get into that meditative state. Uh, I also find that anything that creates a flow state for us where we're we're not thinking about anything else because we have to focus. Like if I go take a tennis lesson or I do Pilates because I'm, I'm new to Pilates, I'm completely focused on just trying to do it right, which you know, you said that you're having that experience during yoga. That's not the worst thing in the world because at least you have a single pointed focus as opposed to thinking about a thousand other different things. Mm-hmm. So I think being gentle with ourselves during mm-hmm. our process and our practice is also helpful. You know, a lot of times people will be like, you know, I am not meditating properly because my mind is wandering so much. There's a huge value in just to sit and watch the mind do what it does mm-hmm. um, and just sit back and become the observer to the mind so that we know we're, we're really, we're not these bodies, but we're in them. We're not these minds, uh, but they're, they're kind of running us. Mm-hmm. So to, to, to connect with source consciousness, to get out of the mental state, even if you're just watching, uh, is hugely valuable. I've also used meditation to, to heal myself very quickly by sending energy to different parts of my body, everything from uh, 
twisted ankle to urinary tract infection. I've used uh, meditation to heal. Um, again, I'm not uh, telling anyone that they shouldn't use medication when needed, but I believe that the uh, practice of sending energy and focusing, and that's something that people can do during their meditation also, is just to send energy through their body, to send light mm -hmm. uh, to different parts of their bodies that might need it. Uh, you know, at this time, probably everybody needs their heart center to be opened up a little bit more uh, because we've been so disconnected from people for the past 16 months mm -hmm. um, that these are all things that you can do to, to just kind of be in that space more often. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. And you had, you had just mentioned um, source consciousness and I, I was reading the notes. Um, you mentioned something about lean consciousness. Is that the same thing or what, what is lean? Uh, the lean consciousness comes from oh. yoga lean. And um, uh, you know, I, I came up with that because in yoga, we have something called witness consciousness where we kind of get to witness our mind, our body, all our actions, all of that. And uh, lean consciousness uh, to me means being so in touch with your physical body mm -hmm. that you know exactly what foods to put in it, what nutrients you need. Um, so that you, you know, and maybe one day for people that's going to be a burger and things that you would think, oh, you know, people think, oh, that's going to make me gain weight or whatever. But mm -hmm. if you're really, if you get to a point where you're very much in tune with your body, then you know what uh, to feed it, you know uh, who to hang out with. You know, some people might not have an energy that's going to be serving you to spend time with. Mm. So that's where that whole lean uh, consciousness term came from. I, I go into it more deeply in the book. Well, I'm gonna try to rephrase what you said. And if I'm wrong, then correct me where, where I messed it up. But it sounds like to me, it's the lean consciousness is kind of an idea to apply to your life broadly about making sure that sort of the things that you're interacting with, I guess, the choices you're making end up putting you in a place that, that you can feel good about. So it's kind of uh, in a, in a way, a sort of like mindfulness around the actions you're taking to make sure that they're in alignment with the outcomes that you want. Tell me where, where I jumbled That's that up. Perfect. That's perfect. I love that. Thank you. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of get the sense of like kind of trusting or actually refining your intuition enough to know what your body needs specifically. Mm -hmm. At Yoga Fit, we, um, we have the essence of Yoga Fit, which we like to remind our students of um, during class, and that's breathing, mm. feeling, listening to your body, letting go of judgment, expectation, and competition, mm. and present in the moment. And I think that uh, listening to our body piece is something that we're not taught as children, unfortunately. If we're lucky at some point during our lives, we stop long enough to, to learn that skill, to listen to our body. You know, I believe our bodies don't lie. So if we really tap in, again, through practices like yoga and, and, and uh, physical practices that get us more in touch with our bodies, we're gonna be making a lot better decisions for ourselves on a daily basis. Right. Yeah. That, that piece definitely rings true for me. I know that it has taken me until just the last couple of years to get in touch with my body and realize that there is so much more information um, in my experience to make decisions from, as opposed to just this singular, like, you know, they're all logical. So I don't want to use the word logic, but just this sort of rational thinking, like, okay, this is the right thing. This is the right thing. Oh, I don't, I can't think of a reason that this is not the right thing or whatever else and realizing just how much more rich information there is in like, how do I feel today? How am I carrying myself? What's my posture? Like, what are, what are all these other things? And then all the other signals that those have, which is to say that sometimes I don't think I'm stressed until I tap into my body and realize like, I've been sitting like this all day and my back hurts and my neck is crooked and I feel exhausted. And so I just wanted to highlight or reiterate what you said, which I think is it's not something that people are generally taught, but it is extremely valuable. And I still think I have a lot of progress to be made, but just in the last couple of years, it's been opening up to me as uh, a source of information equally valuable to 
uh, you know, sort of this thinking like rational, okay, I know some amount of exercise science. So if I move this way, I should feel better. And I know that I should be doing these things, et cetera, et cetera. Um, anyway, no question there. Just, just reiterating that I also think it's very important. Yeah. If we, um, you know, for those listeners um, who have children, if you can get them practicing yoga from an early age, you'll be helping them develop these very valuable skills that they're probably not going to be taught in school. I remember I was principal uh, for the day in New York City for a few years. And the last time I went into a school, they had like a chart of emotions on the wall with like a little <laughs> yeah. match. Mm -hmm. And I did a double take. And I was like, well, we didn't have this when I was in school. So, <laughs> yeah. And the woman said, yeah, this is a new thing. So I was very happy to see that people are actually teaching children about emotions because mm -hmm. that's another language mm -hmm. that we're not, I mean, I would love to revamp our entire education system, to be honest with you, it would look a lot different and, and let's not even talk about school lunches, mm -hmm. but um, for people who have kids, getting them into yoga practice, teaching them meditation is going to go a very long way mm -hmm. in them becoming fully expressed, uh, positive contributing members to society. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I had a read an article a few years back of um, this one school had implemented, I think, both yoga meditation practice for the children. I think they were in middle school. I might be booking it, but I, I do remember like the results was that there were like no more suspensions or like reduced attentions, better performance and grades absolutely made a huge difference. And yeah, no more like less fights and all those things. So, so obviously very impactful. Yeah, we do a, a lot of work in prisons too. And uh, the prisons where we brought yoga fit into, you know, there's less violence mm -hmm. that's happening. And, and, you know, you imagine that someone who is incarcerated mm -hmm. uh, has a lot of time on their hands to do a lot of different things. But imagine, you know, if those people are refining their yoga practice or getting into some heavy duty, deep meditation. I, I believe at that point they can change karma for their next lifetime. Absolutely. Great. Well, Beth, it's been such a pleasure to have you on our show. Was there anything you'd like to, to plug before we wrap up today? Well, if anyone is interested in any of our education at YogaFit, uh, we have programs for everyone from mental health professionals to entrepreneurs, kids, you know, a whole bunch of different health programs. They can go to yogafit.com. If anyone wants to read anything about nutrition or see what I'm up to, they can go to my personal website, bethshaw.com. I'm on Instagram, bethshawmindbody. And you can also find YogaFit on Facebook. So thank you both so much. This has been uh, very lively and uh, great interaction. So thank you. Oh, well, thank you for your, your expertise and your time. It's been a, a wonderful conversation. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please take a second to subscribe as it really helps out a lot. If you're looking for more content, there's all sorts of information over at howtohappy.com. And if you want something a little bit more condensed and concise, I've also written the book Mindscaping, which is essentially a framework for optimizing happiness. So we'll have the link there as well. And that's all I've got. Thanks again. I'll see you next time.